Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another Dynamic Leader Conversation. So today's topic is resilience and specifically leader resilience. Um, in the past year, um, if we've learned anything, it is that diversity can and does appear at any time. And so I think building resilience is an essential skill for not just all leaders, but for anyone um, at any age, really. Um, and so I've got Dr. Linda Follen, um, who is joining me for the discussion. Um, so she's a leading expert in organisational resilience, and she's done recent uh, research investigating the effect of resilience on leadership. Um, and with that, she has a book called Leader Resilience. So thanks so much for joining us today, Linda. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. So um, tell us a little bit about where leader resilience is this something you've been working on for a long time um because I'd imagine that it's just become quite a talking point over the last couple of years uh, but no doubt it's been a, a challenge or something that we've been needing to focus on for a lot longer than that so tell us how you got into that uh, yeah so it, it kind of fortuitous that the timing of um both my PhD research and and the book have kind of hit at exactly the right time so it's, um, I, I started looking into it about 10 years ago because we were starting to get the research telling us that the VUCA world was a reality. We needed to, to actually respond to this constantly changing um, world that we're living in. And um, so I, I commenced my, my doctorate research around the topic because I thought it was relevant <laughs> at that stage. Um, my doctorate was actually finally published at the beginning of 2020. <laughs> Couldn't have chosen a better timing. So it hit the market, it, it hit um, kind of that, that point as literally I graduated and three weeks later we went into lockdown. Um, so it, it, while it's something that's very relevant now, I think we've known for 10 to 15 years that leaders are battling. They're not keeping up. They're not managing to cope in times of change. They're always talking about feeling overloaded, burned out. Um, so very relevant right now, but I, I don't think that perspective has actually changed in the last 10 years. Just we've kind of put it on hold. It wasn't mm. until COVID hit that everyone went, oh, we need to do something about resilience. We've actually been talking about it in businesses for, as I say, quite a chunk of time, but it's become way more prevalent in the last two years. Isn't it lovely how um, COVID and the pandemic and the lockdowns and all of those kind of things have given us a positive nudge in the right directions with some things, you know, technology and, you know, the focus on health and well-being and balance and being able to work wherever. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And, and I think it's exciting because it's opened a new dialogue and people are way more open to talking about how do they cope um, men in particular always seem to be a little more reticent to ask for support, um, but we are actually starting to see more inroads into both genders going, hey, you know, I've got a problem, I'm really not coping, can I get some support, can I get some help? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that the dialogue's been opened um, and it's certainly the right time to be talking about it because the, the impact of COVID has been significant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the mental health issues are much higher than they ever were. In Australia, yeah. we're now up to one in five of us has is on some sort of medication to cope. Um, so, so there's a real push to actually do something different. Yeah, the big numbers, um, not inconsequential either in the business environment. Yeah. Yeah. You say, and, you know, just thinking about the, um, the workplace dynamics and how things have changed and how there is more of a focus on resilience, um, you mention or you talk a lot about um, resilience being attached to um, transformational leadership. And in your book, you say, and I'm, I'm going to quote you on this, um, why do we still have people in positions of power who don't lead their people effectively even when they have all the training necessary to deliver a transformational leadership style. So with that, how has the environment either 
shifted them or you know what's happening in that space where you do have people in position in positions of power that don't lead um, people effectively what have you seen post-COVID? Yeah so I think we're seeing people starting to stand up to leadership more Um, So before, you know, particularly in Australian um, culture, we don't stand up to bad behaviour in the workplace. It's it's pretty much um, not cool to stand up to bad behaviour from your leader. You just kind of duck your head and get on and hope it's going to go away. And I actually, I'm starting to see people stand up and say, sorry, this is not good enough from you, um, Mr. or Mrs. Leader. Um, you need to do something different. So we're definitely starting to get more pushback. Um, certainly our, our premier has got a lot of pushback on keeping the borders closed, which, you know, 10 years mm. ago, we probably wouldn't have had that kind of real strong pushback, even, mm. even in a leadership space. So I believe that leaders are actually going to be pushed to change um, more so than ever before. Do you, it's interesting um, insight around, you know, the political landscape and the pressure that they're getting and that where there's pressure there and it's quite public that people feel like they have more of a voice, that there's more of a um, ground to stand on. Is, is, that, is there a bit of an alignment that you see there? Oh, definitely. And, you know, we're seeing much more push in the gender space. We're seeing much more push in the racial space. Um, people are actually saying, no, it's not okay. Um, it's not okay to be treated um, disrespectfully. And our leaders are really going to have to stand up and be counted. Uh, mm. A lot of them have oopsed into leadership roles, and I think that's a challenge. Um, I hear lots of leaders saying to me, oh, I was the best engineer or I was the best um, scientist or I was the best this, and then I got promoted. But they don't like people. And then they're in a leadership role and suddenly people are are the dominant part of their job. And so the big challenge for us is to actually start to think about who we put into those leadership roles and then support them to develop themselves. But they've got to open themselves to that development because it's not easy. No, that's right. Um, And, you know, I'm I'm seeing a lot more the word effectiveness come out and um, that, you know, you can be productive, that's one thing. You can be busy, um, which I think is a well overused word that probably needs to be put to bed. But, you know, there's this real focus on effective leadership. Um, but tell us about transformational leadership because it definitely sounds more effective, but what's the basis of transformational leadership? Yeah, so Bass's original research around transformational leadership has really, it's really the one leadership model that has stood the test of time. Um, And his his view is that if you want to be effective as a leader, there's some key aspects that you need to deliver to people. You need to take cognizance of them as individuals. So he talks about individualized consideration. He talks about leading transformationally being that charismatic leader but not to the point that people don't believe in you so it's it's got to be authentic charisma uh, <laughs> which is another challenge <laughs> yeah um and and really it's about taking people on a journey with you not telling them what you want them to do traditional leadership styles have always been very dictatorial we still see that in our political arenas uh, <laughs> and we still see that in a lot of a lot of the mining sector organizations still very strongly dictatorial in style we know that doesn't work people don't want to be told you know go do they want to be engaged in the process so transformational leadership is about you as a leader walking the talk, being out there, taking people on a journey with you, actually considering them as human beings, not just as numbers on a sheet to get stuff done. And so that model has really started to dominate. But what we've not seen in the research base is how what do I need to be as a person to lead like that? And that's where my research comes in. So yeah. we've been training transformational leaders, but then they get into, back into the workplace and they go back to what they've always done. 
because until they've changed inside of themselves, they're not going to shift. And so my research really clearly shows there's a direct correlation with your internal leadership and then the external that you present. And that you, when you're doing the internal work, is how you're building resilience? Is that the theory? Yeah. So the theory is you've got to do that internal resilience building on the three levels that we, the, the research identifies three key areas. You need to, first of all, take back control over your life and not be a victim. Secondly, you need to really understand who you are. And we've described it as self-concept well-being. You've got to really get who you are, manage your emotional life and manage your reaction to other people and actually learn how to build strong relationships. And then the third element, which is probably, well, not probably, it has the highest correlation with transformational leadership is constructive thinking. You need to stop constructing destructive processes in your head. So we talk quite a lot about that in the book around using this for good rather than evil. And does that come back to um, that key point, the second key point that you made around that self-concept well-being is the awareness that you require. You need awareness to know whether you are constructing destructive thinking yeah yeah excellent you've got to get inside your head because most of us you know when we talk about racial problems um i i spend a lot of time with leaders cleaning up their own bias because until you clean up your own unconscious bias you're never going to react to someone who's from a different race group in an appropriate way. So it's that cleaning up that we need to do in our heads as leaders to be effective. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about um, what is resilience? Because there's a few definitions out there. The dictionary, dictionary definition just simply says our ability to bounce back from periods of adversity or the speed at which we can. But What's your definition of resilience and why does that matter to leadership? Yeah, so my definition of of resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity, challenge, but also maintain your well-being. So well-being being very broad, your psychological, spiritual, emotional and mental well-being. So that broad well-being piece is correlated because if I'm just bouncing back, I'm going to fall over at some stage. And we see leaders do that. You know, they keep going, keep going. Then they go on holiday and get sick. (laughs) That's not resilience. Resilience is actually having that underlying real strength underneath you that you know that you can keep going, but you're still healthy and well. So if um, leaders are listening to this conversation right now and going, how do I actually do that? Like if I'm not going on holidays to unwind and decompress and do that, then where am I doing it? (laughs) Yeah. So what I talk about quite a lot in the book is that it's not complicated, but it does require discipline. So it's not about, uh, you know, it's not some sort of complicated set of strategies you need to do that are going to make it really hard for you to ever be resilient. But you do need the discipline. It's the same as getting fit in the gym. If you go to the gym once, you ain't going to get fit. Um, The same with, with resilience. And we give, in the book, we give lots of suggestions Um, because one size doesn't fit all. So what you would do to look after your resilience is different to me and is different to every leader. So the work I do um, in executive coaching and in the workshops that we run, we try and we help and support people to find what works for them. And then it's the personal discipline around that. It's no good going, oh, I'll do it today, but I'll forget about it tomorrow because then it's too late. Mm-hmm. And given that everyone is so busy, um, how do how do you kind of create, you know, where do you create that discipline? If people go, oh, I actually just don't have any time, you, you almost have to work a little bit on that first, don't you? 
yeah. So, so uh, <laughs> for years in, in the early part of my career, I used to train people on time management. We know we, we can't manage time. Um, all we can do is choose our priorities. And so I talk to people very clearly around prioritization. If you are a leader and you're not prioritizing your resilience, then you're really not a leader. You're not a leader because you're not doing the effect. You're just doing the management aspects. So what we found in the research is if your resilience drops, you can still do the transactional stuff. You know, you can still sit in the office and answer emails, probably ineffectively, but the transformational stuff becomes impossible if your resilience is low um, because your, your ability to manage your emotions, to manage your head, I mean, we all know when our resilience, uh, you know, if I, if I say to you, you know, if you're feeling crap, are you going to be a good leader? No, you're not. Yeah. Um, colloquially, we've known that for years, but my research is the first to actually say, no, absolutely. If you want to be an effective leader, you have to shift your mindset. You have to shift your internal you first and then learn the skills of how to be a transformational leader. Mm. Similar to um, time um, management and prioritization and just deciding, being really intentional about what people do with their time, I find you can get into um, habits and disciplines and then really quickly get out of that. And I would imagine that, um, you know, the discipline around building resilience would be quite similar. Uh, I think the catalyst for getting back on the time management um discipline is might be a little bit stronger than the resilience one in that when you have low resilience or when your resilience starts to wane you move from transformational to transactional and that that can take a little while to be uncovered as unproductive or ineffective Uh, but then you lose all this time so how do you how do you kind of make that continue to make that a priority um when you when you fall out of that habit yeah it's it's really interesting i think for most of us there are moments where we do that and we don't manage ourselves as well as we should you really really at those times need a good man or good coach or someone in your life that's your bullshit <laughs> it's to you look you really are tired you're not effective you're grumpy do something about it you really need someone who um, can call you out on the stuff when you become ineffective um, I think over time we get better at doing it ourselves if I'm honest I think you know we get better and better at learning how to manage it ourselves but it's always good in those early stages as you're building that capacity as a leader to really learn how to um, go and resource someone who will call you. Um, and that's, mm. you know, a lot of the, the work I do with senior leaders um, is around being their kind of guide when they're starting to tip off. But I think we should all, and we have to take responsibility for that. Um, mm. You know, if, if I'm not feeling good, then I need to get the help. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm lucky as a psych, I have to have a supervisor. But, you know, for all of us, we should be thinking about who's that person who's going to call us when we, you know, when you start to get short or start to not take the cognizance of the important stuff in life. Yeah, I totally get that. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that even I've got a coach or a mentor at any given point in time is, you don't notice when you start to slip because it can happen quite gradually. And so you need someone to go just to ask you a couple of questions to go, oops, I've slipped again, back on the path. Exactly. And, and I always say to, to leaders, your best mates are are not often the best people because they just keep you embedded because they just sympathize with you. And that's keeping you embedded in that, you know, they, they'll go out for a drink with you and sympathize with you. You actually need someone to challenge you and say, you you know, you're not doing what you say you're doing. Um, You're actually losing it. So we need those people who challenge us, even though we don't like, (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think that's the joy of being a coach is it's okay not to be liked, but as long as there's this understanding that we're all moving to a better place, then you can keep going. Yeah, and I think I think we're getting more open in the business forums. As I say, I think the COVID has has opened the conversation. So more business people at senior levels are going, actually, maybe I should have a coach. Maybe I should have a mentor. Maybe I should have someone that's going to support me in this um, and get us back on track. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, you talk about seven habits. Uh, but not in the Stephen Covey way. It, this is the seven habits of highly resilient organisations, which I've never seen before. But um, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So part of part of my research, while it's not in my my doctorate research, um, part of the research started to uncover what are some of the factors that make highly successful organisations organizations that are resilient and able to bounce back in this context. And this, there, are, there are seven aspects that really do help organizations to stay on track in a COVID setting. And we're starting to see the organizations that have those in place and those that don't. <laughs> um, so, you know, the starting point is you've got to be clear about where you're heading. Um, and you've got to really be clear about your vision, the values that encompass how you deliver that vision in your organization and be really directed to the future because today might not look so great, but, you know, tomorrow might be better. So you've got to be vision led as an organization. And we talk about a number of aspects. The one that I think in Australia that we're not as good at is dealing with bad behavior in organizations. We avoid it like the plague. Um, and, and I talk about boundaries because yeah. boundary setting is important for us as human beings because um, Brené Brown talks about trust being built from good boundaries. The same in organizations. Um, if you don't have good boundaries, then bad behavior starts to erode particularly if resilience levels are low in people. They, they start to do things that are inappropriate. And if we're not calling it, they just become worse and worse and worse. So mm. particularly in the context of COVID, I think the ba clear boundaries is so important. Mm. And then the other one that, that I've, uh, that's particularly relevant um, in the COVID setting is staying in tune with the external environment, keeping... You've got to be, it's no good becoming insular. You've got to be looking out to the external world. What's going on? What am I seeing? What do we need to respond to? What are we going to have to shift and change? Because mm. Charles Handy, who's one of the experts in organizational development, talks about staying ahead of the curve. Um, you've got to stay ahead of the curve. As an organization, if you're standing still in today's world, you're already irrelevant. So it's those so, are the key yeah. ones that, you know, in the present context. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that makes so much sense. And I am talking to a lot of not just leaders or, um, you know, heads of, but individuals as well around where's your awareness. And um, I think a lot of people really struggle with building awareness um, sometimes outside of their team. Um, sometimes outside of their business um, and most of the time outside of their industry because uh, I don't see it as being relevant but we're all we're all interconnected aren't we and so the same as we need to break down silos within businesses we also need to break down the silos that come with industries because um, when you start to see what's happening in the broader environment not really that much of a surprise when it when it hits us no, you know, I mean, if you look at certainly in Western Australia at the moment, and I think it's true across the, the country, but people are a bit surprised that they're battling to recruit. And I'm going, well, if you've been looking at the press, <laughs> we can't get any migrants in. <laughs> We're not letting anyone in our borders. <laughs> Of course, yeah. that's going to be an issue. And, you know, it, traditionally, um, we've always been able to pillage people from across 
the stay from across the country. Now people are even reticent to move um, within the state, you know, especially yeah. if their family near them. Um, so, you know, those contextual issues, unless you're staying aware of them, you're going to be surprised at what hits you. So I spend a lot of time talking to organisations around how to actually stay ahead of that curve. And unfortunately, the curve is six to 12 months. And it doesn't, it doesn't take much to, to do that. I think, you know, coming back to creating some discipline, I think there's discipline required around just, you don't have to go on mainstream media, but flick through some kind of, you know, Flipboard is a really good one, good sort of app to um, look at. Even just scrolling through LinkedIn, you can start to see, um, you know, some interesting insights coming out, listening to experts. I think, I think we overcomplicate it. It's like, oh, I need to spend three hours a week kind of doing this. It's not, it's like 15 minutes a day, three days a week kind of thing. Just get your, yeah. get your head across it. Is that sort of what your, your thoughts are? Yeah, I think, I think you've got to have some feeds um, from whatever, from whatever platform you use. Um, people spend an inordinately large amount of time on social media, which is generally a total waste of time. So I go, stop spending so much time on Facebook and actually get yourself some good news feeds that are telling you what's going on in the world. You know, there's so much, you know, so it's so easy to access, but you do have to, you have to splice it so that you're not overloaded. Mm. Um, mm. Definitely think there's an overload of information, but, you know, particularly if I'm, if I'm going into a client, I want to go, you know, if I'm going into Chevron today, I want to know what's been going on over the weekend. If they've, you know, if they've been hit by X, Y, and Z, then I want to know before I walk in so that yeah. I don't look like an idiot. And, and that's what we should be doing. We should be, what's going on in our world? Who are our key um, players? You know, the, mm. the, the mining sector in WA are, you know, being challenged at the moment massively with gender issues. Mm. Um, you know, as a leader in the mining sector, if you haven't got your head around those gender issues, you're at risk of getting into a lot, lot, lot of trouble. So, mm. you know, different things are hitting different organisations um, at the moment. Mm. So you want to be ahead of what's going on in your external world. And it's not hard. No. And I also add to that, you know, you don't have to read a whole article. You don't have to read a whole. And I was talking to someone about this the other day. I'm like, oh, if you're reading a book and you're not getting anything it, just put it down. Yeah. Um, and it was a little bit of a foreign concept. What do you mean? Put the book down before I finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually just, don't finish it Um, because it doesn't if it's not giving you anything then it doesn't deserve your attention and there's a lot of other ways that you can get information I think there's this because there is so much information we feel obliged to consume as much as we possibly can versus you know just take as much as you need to get the general idea and then if you are going into like a Chevron or you know one of your mining companies then you go okay I need to go a little bit deeper on that now for this purpose but at least you know it exists yeah yeah, and, you know, there's so much out there. You know, I love TED Talks and podcasts and, and and all you do is put in the topic that you're interested in and it'll bring up a load of stuff. You know, we, we all spend a fair amount of time in transport, um, probably less so than we used to, but, you know, there's a lot of time where we've got downtime. People say to me, you know, have you, have you done a doctorate? Have you done a, written a book? Well, I just choose not to waste my time watching TV. You know, I, I would rather do something useful. We've got a lot of time that we use, and that's why I say it's a prioritization piece. We have mm. to prioritize. The human being can't keep going um, and doing more. We have to learn how to do more effectively and actually mm. put our energy into what's going to make a difference and build our capacity as leaders rather than reduce it. You know, sitting mm. watching, I, I do a lot of work in um, some of the local governments. And, you know, if you're sitting watching what your community is saying on an hourly, daily basis, that'd make you depressed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would really make you depressed um, for, yeah. for some local governments. So, you know, it's do I need to read that? I read the important ones, but actually then put something positive back in. 
you know, go watch a TED talk on community engagement if that's what you need to do. But I, I think we've got to we've got to make better choices in what we invest our time in. Yeah, I agree, and I think again that comes back to your point around that um, that well being and awareness, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, you talk about uh, pressure versus stress and being it being around how you see the situation. Um, tell us more about that, pressure versus stress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, quite, quite honestly, um, all of us are under pressure, yeah? Correct. I, I don't need a single business person that's not under pressure. Whether it's, whether it's pressure at work or it's pressure to get stuff done at home or whether it's pressure from COVID, we're all under a massive amount of pressure, but we all manage that pressure differently. And it only converts to stress when I take it into me and convert it into stress. And is that something that is done um, consciously or unconsciously? Unconsciously, unconsciously, yeah. unfortunately. So, and, and that's why constructive thinking is such an important, uh, and, and constructive thinking is quite a new piece of research. Um, Simo Epstein, who's the main author in um, constructive thinking, actually only wrote his book in uh, 2014. So the research behind that's really new. And what, what his view is, is that if you can, when stuff comes into you, if you can construct it in a healthy way, then you don't take your system down and you don't reduce your resilience. Unfortunately, what happens when pressure comes in, we often convert it into something negative. And so once we convert it, now we've chosen a negative emotion. And while there's a lot of research around emotional intelligence, what we're, what we're seeing is if you can stop that negative thinking in your head, then you actually don't have to manage your emotional intelligence as much because your emotions flow from what you tell yourself in your head. So if you've got a pile of work and you go, oh, yay, that's a cool pile of work. <laughs> I'm going to get to that sometime over the next week that's going to have a positive impact on you and your ability to cope with it. If you go, oh, that's terrible, I'm never going to get through it, then you're already, you're telling yourself instantly that that pressure should result in stress. And so we actually convert our experiences in here before we actually choose an emotional reaction. And I talk quite a lot about the how the brain works um, in terms of that in the book. Because mm. if we could, if we could stop that <laughs> and convert our response to pressure more healthily, we wouldn't get into that um, stress space. Um, but yes, unfortunately for most of us, it's unconscious. So is our self-chat. Mm. You know, we talk to ourselves all the time, unconsciously, um, yeah. and that's eroding your resilience as well. So, uh -huh. you know, if you go, oh, I've got to get to a meeting, got to get to a meeting, got to get to a meeting, you're stressing yourself instantly. Whereas if you go, oh, I've got a meeting, I'll get there on time, you're choosing a non-stress response. It's all about reframing, isn't it? It's around correcting how you respond in your head. But you've got to become conscious of that first, which is why it's the internal work that we need to do as leaders. You know, mm. as leaders, we need to correct our internal processing to be effective in that external environment. Um, mm. but there is no, there is no shortcut to that. Yeah. So uh, build awareness. Start to you know check in throughout the day. What am I actually saying to myself? Um, and then it would be you know, after the fact, let me reframe that. And at some point it wouldn't even need to be reframed. It would come naturally, wouldn't it? Yeah. Basically, you were, I know it sounds a bit odd, but you're rewiring your brain. Yeah. Um, if you listen to Ash Barty's um, mind coach, 
he talks, uh, he's, he's done a couple of podcasts now, and he talks about, you know, helping Ash Barty to rewire her brain. Because you don't win at sport in your physical body. You win in here. Um, the same Bolt in his book um, on, on his life talks about the same thing. When he goes down into the um, blocks, he's actually actually talking to himself and telling himself to be positive, to turn his mind off, not do negative self-talk. So we know that that works in sport. We've just been a bit slow to understand the importance in a leadership space. And you can definitely tell a leader who has done that work. Um, they are, they're just like a swan, you know, they, they just glide through situations. Um, they're highly resilient um, nothing, they don't sweat the small stuff. They, yeah, you can just really tell the difference, can't you? Yeah, and, and we're starting to see it very starkly now because our leaders are under so much more um, external pressure. If they haven't done the work, I'm afraid they're really battling in, in this context because they're not even conscious that they've got that extra layer of emotional reaction on, on top of the normal. So they're not, they're not responding to that well. And then, you know, something goes wrong, they're bored, have a go at them, and then they explode, yeah? Um, so we're seeing it more and more um, in terms of that leadership space. Uh, yeah, so if, um, if our listeners, if you haven't started um, to create a, a bit of a discipline around building your resilience, then uh, yesterday was a good time to start with that. Um, but just a final, I guess, piece of advice, Linda, is if you were, were going to start somewhere in building resilience as a leader, what would be the first thing you'd do? Um, I think I would first and foremost get some sort of mindfulness practice that is comfortable, easy to use, um, and you can do it at the drop of a hat. Because what mindfulness allows you to do is to give yourself the space to actually go, oh, I'm overreacting. Um, so there's lots of strategies out there. There's moving mindfulness activities. There's static ones find one that works for you. There's so many, um, there's lots of apps nowadays. There's lots of um, ways of doing it. You know, any of the martial arts, yogas, meditation, there's millions of strategies. Find one that, that works for you and use that as a starting point because that will allow you to start to calm your system down and actually start to be able to separate out from your mind so that your mind's not controlling you. Biggest thing is to get control of your mind. Yeah, take control of it. I love it. That's great. And I love that you um, I love that you say find something that works for you because there's just millions of, of ways um, and there's not one way that is going to work for every single person. So if you are in a practice at the moment and you're finding it's not working, then um, find something else. And yeah. yeah. yeah and keep going until you do find something um, that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. There's no cookie cutters in this. You've got to find your own strategy. Um, and, you know, I don't think I've got a single client that has the same strategy as another one. So No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. That's great. That's an excellent note to end it on. Thank you so much for your time today, Linda. And um, if anyone is wanting to buy a copy of um, Resilient Leader, then definitely um, check out the comments. I'll put a link to the site where you can grab a coffee. And if you want to connect with Linda, I'll put her LinkedIn profile in there too. Um, but thanks again for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And for all our listeners, thanks for joining us. And I look forward to another dynamic leader conversation with you soon. Thanks.